Throughout much of his tenure, President Joe Biden has been dogged by critiques of his mental acuity. Opponents of his have latched onto a number of gaffes that he has made this year. At an event in September on hunger, President Biden began his remarks thanking individuals responsible for organizing the conference. The president called out for Representative Jackie Belorsky, an Indiana congresswoman who died over the summer in a car accident. The backlash to that incident was immediate, with Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre forced to play defense on the event. Other gaffes include referring to Vice President Kamala Harris as president, his wife Joe Biden as vice president, and confusing the war in Iraq with the war in Ukraine. Now, to why we're all here uh, for this, uh, this historic day. Uh, the Secretary of Agriculture already said anything, so I'm leaving. <laughs> So I apologize you for any repetition that may occur here. But all kidding aside, uh, you know, uh, um, it's been over 50 years, to state the obvious. You all know it well. Since President Nixon convened the original White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. And the sing this, that single conference and the laws it inspired, it inspired led to transformational change that has helped millions of Americans live healthier lives for generations. Since that time, advances in research and medicine have taught us so much more about nutrition and health. And today, <laughs> I'm convening this conference again because I believe we can use these advances to do even more to make America stronger and a healthier nation. And so many of you know so much about this as well, and you're committed. And I want to thank all of you here, for in including bipartisan elected officials like Representative Governor, Senator Braun, Senator Booker, Representative Jackie, are you here? Where's Jackie? I didn't think she was, she was going to be here to help make this a reality. And thanks to Senator Stabenow, Representative DeLauro, for their leadership. And here today, uh, we have advocates and activists. Uh, Jose Andres, you heard of him, haven't you? La 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 last time we hung out on the Ukrainian border in Poland. Um, and leaders of business, labor, agriculture, faith, and philanthropy and uh, to achieve ambitious goals that I know we can do if we work together. I really do know we can do this. End hunger in this country by the year 2030. You know, we're dealing with that for a whole second. Inflation is a worldwide problem right now because of a war in Iraq and the impact on oil and what Russia's doing, I mean, excuse me, the war in, in Ukraine. And uh, I think of Iraq because that's where my son died. The, uh, because he died. The, uh, but the point is that they're, uh, you know, that's why it's up. We have the lowest inflation rate of almost any major country in the world. We've done a lot to try to take it under control. I've released millions of barrels of oil from our Strategic Petroleum Reserve, keeping the price down. It's down about $1.25 and going down. It needs to go more. But they talk about inflation all the time. What in God's name? And they ask why I call this the Inflation Reduction Act. If you have to take a prescription that costs you an arm and a leg, and I reduce that, and you don't have to pay as much, it reduces your cost of living. It reduces inflation in your paycheck. And by the way, no, I'm serious. My dad used to say everybody deserves a little bit of breathing room. Granted, when the price of a, gas, of the, a gallon of gasoline went up, we talked about it at our kitchen table. We weren't poor. We were an average middle-class family. We lived in a three bedroom split level house in a development in a suburban area. We we're in a situation where, uh, you know, we had four kids and a grandpa living with us. And, uh, but it was, we, we weren't poor, but we didn't have any money. We didn't have anything left over. And so it was, you know, do you have anything left to have a little bit of breathing room? Look what's happening to drug prices on average Americans. It's actually outrageous. But this year, we finally beat pharma. We finally beat pharma. No, I'm, I've been trying this a long, long time, Debbie. I've been trying to do it. Finally. Big pharma lost and Americans won. Thanks again to the Democrats in the Congress. We finally got to the point where no one's denying that we have a climate problem. I was able to get not all I needed, but $369 billion put in that bill.
And we had, I think the guys were with me, uh, the Congress were with me when I had, I invited the CEOs of the auto companies to the White House lawn in the back, you know, behind the White House. And I talked about automobiles and I talked about electric vehicles. At the time, Amy Barrett uh, was uh, Barrett, Chairman Barrett of General Motors, was suing the state of California because you had a higher standard for emissions than the rest of the country, and they said they couldn't do that. Well, she left that meeting and she dropped the suit, called me up and said they're going to go all electric by 3035. Every other company has signed up to do the same thing. So we're working with the auto industry to, to transition to electric vehicle future, providing tax credits to buy electric vehicles, as well as any IBW guys here? Well, guess what? You guys are going to install 50, excuse me, 500,000 charging stations around the country. So it's going to be, you know, that's like 500,000 gas stations. Not a joke. 500,000, because people are going to say, I'm not buying a vehicle because that can only take me X number of miles. And by the way, we're investing billions of dollars, and many of you are investing billions of dollars in battery technology. We're now changing the nature of the, the life of a battery. Thank you, Mr. President. I also have a question for you about um, China, but before I do, I just wanted to follow up on something you said earlier. When you said it remains to be seen whether the Ukraine government is prepared to compromise with Russia. Previously, you've told us the only thing for the Russians to do is get completely out of Ukraine, go back to the, the lines that existed prior to February 24. Are you suggesting with the word compromise that you think that there is room for territorial compromise now? That no, I'm not. Yeah, that's up to the Ukrainians. Nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. I didn't have any in mind. Uh, you have asked the question whether or not, if I recall, whether or not what would happen if, in fact, after the, this, I, I think the context is that whether or not they're pulling back from Fallujah and the, I mean, from the, the Kherson, the, the city of Kherson, and they're coming back across the river to the eastern side of the river, the Russian forces. And I said, what's going to happen is they're going to all both lick their wounds, decide whether what they're going to do over the winter, and decide whether or not they're going to compromise. That's, that's what's going to happen, whether or not. I don't know what they're going to do. And, but I do know one thing. We're not going to tell them what they have to do. We saw extraordinary results in these midterms elections that no one thought possible. More independents voted for Democrats and Republicans in this election. Young people. You voted in historic numbers again, just as you did two years ago. Young people voted to continue addressing the climate crisis, gun violence, personal rights and freedoms, student debt relief, all those things which you stepped up to do. As I said, women in America made their voices heard, man. I said last year that one of the most extraordinary things about the Dobbs decision is what was about to challenge American women when the justice said, let's see, they have it in their power, basically saying, let's see what they're going to do. Well, guess what? Y'all showed up and beat the hell out of them. Look, I said it then. Those who support ripping away the rights to choose don't have a clue about the power of women in America, but now I think they do. And, we're just, and by the way, no one worked harder to get that message across America than this lady right here. Let me start off with two words. Made in America. Made in America. And that's not hyperbole. I'm not joking about that, as you know. And I want to say up front, and the management here is, understands, and I'm proud of them, I'm a union guy, and I tell you what, I made it real clear to everybody, whether speaking to the National Chamber of Commerce or the Business Roundtable, the reason I'm the most pro-union president in American history is because you're the single best workers in the world. Not a joke. You know, a lot of people think that you just show up and you got a job. How about those three, four, five years sometimes of apprentice work? 
that you're about getting full pay. It's like going back to school. And so what I've seen happen now is they're figuring out, everybody's figuring out that the supply chain and only on time purchases is a big problem. Now we're figuring it out. If it's made in America, we're going to invent it in America, it's made in America. And it also is focused on going after fraudsters who call borrowers. They're going to, you're going to receive these calls. I tell anybody who has, who's qualifying for these loans or trying to qualify for these loans. If you get a call pretending they're from the government trying to help you with your loans, let's be clear, hang up. You never have to pay for any federal help from the student loan program. You're going to get calls if you do this and we'll pay that, you can get relief. That's fraud. If you get any questionable calls, please tell us by going to report fraud, report fraud, D-O-T-F-T-C dot gov. My message to fraudsters looking to cheat the American people is don't do it. We're going to hold you accountable. And Lieutenant Governor, I was saying something nice about you. That's why it went out. And uh, but I'm saying we're going to try like the devil to keep you from having to, we're not having to deciding to leave. I wish you didn't. And 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 John, thank you uh, very much for uh, for running. I really do appreciate it. And Zell, you're gonna you're gonna be a great uh, a great lady in the Senate. Is very honest. Schools can and should be open this winter. We have all the tools to keep kids safe. Unvaccinated kids are at risk, yet the vaccinated are going to have a way to protect them. Get vaccinated. If you're vaccinated, get boosted. Folks, I know we're all tired and frustrated about the pandemic. These coming weeks are going to be challenging. Please wear your mask in public to protect yourself and others. We're going to get through this. We're going to get through it together. We have the tools to protect people from severe illness due to Omicron if people choose to use the tools. We have the medicines coming along that can save so many lives and dramatically reduce the impact that COVID has had on our country. There's a lot of reason to be hopeful in 2020. But for God's sake, please take advantage of what's available. Please. You're going to save lives, maybe yours, maybe your child. And I want you to know that I've had an incredible partner. Jill has watched over the progress of uh, the USS Delaware for years. The daughter of a Navy signalman during World War II, the mother of a member of the Delaware National Guard, and the grandmother of children who experienced having their father deployed away from home for a year at a time. She always holds our military and their families in her heart. And that is not hyperbole. That's real. And I'm deeply proud of the work she's doing as First Lady with Joining Forces Initiative. She started with Michelle Obama when she was Vice President and now carries on. As First Lady, she doesn't, she's been to more military inst installations around the world. She's hosted more than 20 events for military families. And she's working, working to expand economic opportunities for military spouses, who, by the way, in the words of Keats, they also serve, will only stand and wait. And a submariner's spouse stands and waits a lot and to help military kids with the support they need and to make sure survivors and caregivers have the resources they deserve. 